and welcome to World Inside with me, Tian Wei, coming to you from Beijing on CGTN. Coming up on today's program, South Korean President Moon Jae-in meets with President Donald Trump from the United States ahead of the historic DPRK U.S. summit. Couldn't all systems go for the summit with Kim Jong-un after Moon's White House meeting? And the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum kicks off Thursday with a focus on building an economy of trust. Can trust be built in a time of resurging protectionism? Watching World Insight, I'm Tian Wei. We begin today's program with South Korean President Moon Jae-in's visit to the United States. He has met with President Trump at the White House on Tuesday. Mr. Moon said South Korea will continue close coordination on developments regarding the Korean Peninsula. His visit came ahead of the historic summit between Trump and DPRK leader Kim Jong-un. Before our discussion, take a look at this. Two presidents and allies sitting together but not talking the same language when it comes to the planned summit. U.S. President Trump suggested a possible delay in the upcoming meeting, even as South Korea's President Moon talked as though the Singapore summit was still on track. There are certain conditions that we want, and I think we'll get those conditions. And if we don't, we don't have the meeting. And if it doesn't happen, uh, maybe it'll happen later. Maybe it'll happen at a different time. But we will see. Uh, we are looking forward to the first ever U.S.-North Korea summit and we find ourselves uh, standing one step closer to the dream of achieving complete denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula and world peace. Trump talked of a changed attitude from the DPRK about getting rid of its nuclear weapons, even at one stage pointing the finger at China, suggesting something may have happened at the second meeting between President Xi and Kim Jong-un. But for both the DPRK and South Korea, Pyongyang's recent reticence stems from this man, U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton, who compared the current negotiations with the DPRK to those with Libya, which gave up its nuclear weapons research in 2003. Libya's leader, Muammar Gaddafi, was overthrown and killed after a Western-backed intervention in 2011. Well, the DPRK reacted angrily to that comparison. Last week, a top DPRK official issued this statement. This is not an expression of intention to address the issue through dialogue, he said. It is essentially a manifestation of an awfully sinister move to impose on our dignified state the destiny of Libya or Iraq, which had been collapsed due to the yielding of their countries to big powers. U.S. President Trump is rejecting the Libya model and said Tuesday he was prepared to guarantee Kim Jong-un's safety if a deal was reached. But just three weeks from this planned summit, and there are still deep differences about how any deal would be negotiated. The White House warns Pyongyang to essentially give up all its nuclear weapons before any economic incentives are given. Pyongyang and Seoul want a step-by-step -step approach that will build trust over time. Nathan King, CGTN, at the White House. For more discussion on Trump Moon meeting, we are joined in Beijing by Mr. Yi Hailin, who is the director of the Center of South Asia Studies from the National Institute of International Studies at Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Welcome, sir. In Medford, we have Professor Sun Yong Lee from Kim Ku Korea Foundation of Korean Studies at Lecture School at Tufts University. Joining us in Washington, D.C., Michael O'Hanlon, Senior Fellow with the Center for 21st Century Security and Intelligence, and also Director of Research for Foreign Policy at the Brookings Institution. Gentlemen, welcome to our program. Will the meeting between the two be able to pave the way for the summit if it is still going to take place on June 12th? Let's go to Professor Lee. Well, Kim Jong-un has given the South Korean president, Moon Jae-in, some homework. In fact, I would say now Mr. Moon's visit with Mr. Trump has more meaning because coming some 25 days or so after that dramatic inter-Korean summit meeting in April, uh, it was a little anticlimactic. There would have been no sensitive information or intelligence value added to the meeting between the two leaders. So now Mr. Moon has the onus, the homework of 
persuading President Trump to be more accommodating, to be more flexible, and not walk away from the meeting. And I think both Kim and Trump have political victories to be gained by effecting the actual summit, so the mm. meeting is more likely to happen than not. Mm. But you know, Mr. O'Hanlon, it seems that what has been happening over the days is very much not like what President Trump has been presenting to the rest of the world that during the other days when he's in office. Namely, he's becoming very patient. He seems to be not easily irritated by words coming from Kim Jong-un, the North Korean partner that he has over there. Uh, does that say much about what he has in mind of what's likely to be achieved? Well, I think that's a very good point you've made. I agree with that. Uh, certainly when you watch President Trump interact with some of his domestic critics here in the United States, people who are far nicer individuals than Kim Jong-un, people who have far less blood on their hands than Kim Jong-un does personally, uh, Mr. Trump often winds up in very vitriolic and angry exchanges with a lot of Democrats and other American uh, critics of his agenda. And therefore, to see the sort of love fest that's been going on between President Trump and, and President Kim has been strange, to say the least. I, I think there's perhaps a method to the madness that uh, we need to create some good atmospherics to have a um, conversation that's even possibly going to be useful. But we have to be careful not to go too far. And in a way, I find the recent talk of putting the summit in doubt or on ice for the moment, I, in some ways this is reassuring to me because it feels more normal. It doesn't feel mm. quite as out of proportion with the nature of the two governments at issue and especially with the nature of the North Korean government. So in a way, the ratcheting down of those tensions, or the ratcheting down of that a very positive atmosphere is probably inevitable. And, and yet, as you say, Trump is still being right. fairly patient with Kim. Um, I think it's probably smart, but you're right, it's a little bit incongruous with a number of other realities. Mr. Ye, here's the thing. The two sides have to be able to indicate to the other mm -hmm. that they are going to address each other's concerns. Yes. But at the same time, this is a negotiation. Nobody wants to put their cards on the table before the cards are really becoming real. So that's a very delicate balance one would keep. How far, so far, rather, Mr. Ye, how do you think the two sides have been making that balance? I think currently the two sides already sent some signal or information to, the, to their partners to launch a test. One case is the joint drill. In recently, spontaneously happened in Korean Peninsula, and while the the two sides preparing for the for the for the summit in in Singapore. But we should notice that the two, this joint drill is is very often uh, it's a very frequent and normal case. So probably uh, the suspend of the high level uh, talks between the South and the North is only a test sent uh, released by the North try to show their attitude. But I would like to remind another dangerous uh, uh, signal that the, uh, Donald Trump, uh, President Donald Trump withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal. And this potential, uh, this probably caused some negative impact to the North part because obviously the, North, uh, the DPRK will worry about if they make the deal with United States and then in the future America withdraw again, what will happen? At that time when they dismantled their nuclear right. bomb, there were a lot of issues. But the, one thing probably positive that is this idea, make the deal with the DPRK, is the idea of the President Trump. It's not the idea from the Democratic. So also some potential the, the White House will fulfill mm. this commitment. So right. it's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, Professor Lee, what about that balance from your perspective? You want to do the indication, but you don't want to show the real cards. But you have to do the indication in reflection of the cards that you want to play or you have to play. As for walking away from the Iran deal, of course it raises questions of U.S. credibility in the future with respect to other agreements. Right. At the same time, we know that North Korea also, or moreover, North Korea has violated blatantly both the letter and spirit of every major international agreement. So we should not forget that there are questions of credibility about North Korean compliance. Well, this is not a competition of discredibility uh, as we are speaking right now. But 
let me go to the most important question also. Mr. O'Hanlon, from now till June the 12th, if there is going to be any June the 12th summit, what do you think are some of the likely stages while we are building our road there? I think that any kind of negotiation should think about four main stages of denuclearization. And there will have to be incentives along the way, especially in steps three and four. We're already in step one, which is North Korean moratorium on testing. Step two has to be a moratorium on production of more fissile material. And this requires intrusive verification. Because right now, as far as we know, North Korea is still making more bombs, and that's not really acceptable. Step three has to be dismantling their ability to make bombs, not just verifying that centrifuges have been shut down, mm -hmm. but actually dismantling them, uh, actually dismantling plutonium reprocessing facilities and re nuclear reactors. And then step four is the actual disarmament, the weapons going out of the country to some agreed custodian or third party or what have you. Uh, Mr. O'Hanlon, one of the things that the U.S. has committed, at least by President Trump, whether he means it or not, is that the U.S. is going to address the security concerns of the DPRK. But here's the thing, if that to be done, yep. what has to be done in stages by the United States to prepare for final fulfillment of that promise toward the DPRK? Whether it is legal procedure, political preparedness back at home, inside the United States, U.S. working with allies such as South Korea and also working with countries such as China, which were part of then the issue during the war. So how would that work? Has the U.S. states thought about that? What would be the state that the U.S. has to follow on its own about this? It's a great question. I think the different tools we have at our disposal we could scale back some of the exercises, but we still have to do a lot of exercises to stay prepared. North Korea still has a million person army, chemical and biological and nuclear weapons, so we have to stay prepared, but we could scale back the size. Second, we could talk about signing a peace treaty. I'm a little different than many people on this. I think we could sign a peace treaty very soon uh, because I would welcome North Korea's commitment not to attack South Korea, and it wouldn't have to imply complete normalization of diplomatic relations. We could save that for later. We could also imagine deployment of an international monitoring force along the DMZ to verify that both sides were complying with their obligations under a peace treaty. Uh, over time, we could rethink the size and scale of the U.S. military presence in Korea, but I do not think that should happen now because it's already a very small presence compared to the size of North Korea's army. So that one, I believe, we should actually hold until we get closer to step four of what mm -hmm. I was talking about earlier, the disarmament phase. And even then, even then, I do not believe that we should link the entirety of the U.S. ROK alliance to a denuclearization path. We may have very good reasons, and South Korea may have very good reasons to keep an alliance even after denuclearization, but it could be a much smaller military footprint. Mm. Professor Lee, I know over the past few episodes of our discussion, you are somewhat apparently reluctant to talk about what the U.S. can do for its preparedness for a negotiation. But if I ask you to help us understand better about the different stages, if the United States was ever committed to a security guarantee for DPRK, what would you say? Well, the U.S. has put down in ink security assurance, security guarantee. It's in the 1994 Geneva Accord, for example. The two Korean states have signed in 1991 a mutual non-aggression and reconciliation agreement. But these agreements on paper have been rather meaningless because North Korea has violated each one of them. And the question as to why then North Korea insists on a peace treaty is a complex matter. A peace treaty would make things a bit complicated for South Korea because South Korea would have to unofficially recognizing the North Korean state uh, in terms of treaty law, would have to revise its constitution. A peace treaty sounds very wonderful, but it would call into question the very raison d'etre of U.S. troops in the South. So as counterintuitive as it may sound, 
I would not be surprised if President Trump doing things in an unconventional way as he does even surprises President Moon and says we plan the US plans to withdraw some troops a few thousand or maybe 10,000 troops mm. from South Korea very soon and offer that as a concession to Kim Jong-un and the reason for that happening might be that President Trump in his own mind may be thinking this sends a severe warning to both yeah. North Korea and South Korea. It sends a message to the North, we may be more amenable to striking first if you don't, if you don't comply and to the South, we will maybe abandon you let you, you know, cope with the North Korea problem on your own in the future if you are not with us 100 percent. Um, we understand, Mr. O'Hannon, for example, in the trade dispute discussion between China and United States, uh, within the U.S. team, according to some media reports, there were spars already happening among themselves, and they did not agree with one another when they are trying to negotiate with the other countries. Will similar situation happen? many wonder, in Singapore during Trump's meeting summit with the DPRK leader, will also the U.S. team in a way fighting within itself, and if that were the case, how things will be resolved or evolve from there? It's an interesting question. I don't expect that it'll be a large U.S. team. I could be wrong. I don't think, for example, you would have to have Secretary Mattis there because I don't really think you're going to get into detailed discussions about exactly which U.S. troops would move where. Again, I don't think that should be on the negotiating table right now anyway. So uh, my guess is that Secretary Pompeo is the key person as an advisor and aide to President Trump and as a person with his own uh, relationship now with President Kim. John Bolton would probably want to go and uh, perhaps will go, but my own view is that Pompeo is the person everybody could agree um, is well informed, uh, understands the different sensitivities, and is probably closest to Trump and closest to the process. So I would think he would be a good part of the team. Beyond that, it's just speculation for me. Mm. Thank you so much uh, for being with us. Uh, Michael O'Hanlon, I understand you have to go to other meetings. Thank you for being with us. But let me go to you, Professor Lee, also about the same question. What is likely to be the U.S. team if there is going to be a team? Well, I mean, President Trump and Kim Jong-un just could meet tete-a-tete -tete with interpreters present. What does that mean? It means perhaps a more frank exchange of views, uh, better camaraderie perhaps, or hostility. We'll have to see. But let me remind our viewers, Mike Pompeo has met with Kim Jong-un twice in about 40 days now and has reached some kind of an understanding, even a personal rapport, perhaps. But he's the one who not so long ago said, very provocatively, that the U.S. has to separate Kim Jong-un, the regime, from its nuclear weapons. Mm. What does that mean? It means there's a strong implication that the U.S. must remove Kim Jong-un from power. That was considered to be a very provocative statement less than a year ago, and now Pompeo is viewed as a softliner compared with the National Security Advisor, Bolton. I see. Well, Mr. Ye from China. It yeah. is not just the United States and the DPRK mm -hmm. that's really paying attention to the summit on June the 12th. It is everybody. China too. China said China welcome the efforts coming from both sides walking toward one another in terms of seeking solutions to the problem. What will be China's role from now on? I think China still could have the potential to provide a very uh, a useful uh, mediator uh, to play as a very useful mediator for the negotiation. We can recall the history. Uh, it's a, there are only three countries peacefully dismantled their nuclear capacity. One is Kazakhstan, one is Ukraine, and another one is uh, South Africa. South Africa is very a uh, very special case. We can focus on the Kazakhstan and, and Ukraine. Actually, these two countries' denuclearization process is guaranteed by the international community, not only uh, guaranteed by only one or two big powers. So, uh, related to the DPRK case, I think only the commitment made by Donald Trump won't make 
uh, DPRK feel satisfied or feel confident. So still, international guarantee is very important part. But I would like to uh, my, uh, put another additional discussion is that if American side thought is that negotiation or discussion in Singapore will be the one side raise the condition, another side will take the action, and then uh, one side will observe what the achievement they already made and then think that for the next. Such kind of the pattern won't work because mm. obviously DPRK is looking for an equal negotiation. That means one side makes the step, another one will follow one. So they will be a kind of a pattern. Not mm. only so one country raises a lot of questions and waiting for I the answers. Got it. Yeah. Professor Lee, therefore, the so called step by step by two sides that goes parallel would become extremely important. Besides their own, their own countries, such as the PRK and the U.S. thinking about this, do you think the other parties of the previous mechanism of six-party talk could be of any help? I think so, because it's always in the best interest of the United States and its allies, South Korea and Japan, to share the burden, to share the blame of failure and to have more witnesses, more vested parties, crucially China in the room. But at the same time, we have seen in the past all these terms laid out in ink, in writing, in return for North Korea's moratorium, freeze, no more tests, uh, revealing certain facilities, coming under the inspection of the IAEA and so on. The U.S. would do this, provide food and fuel mm -hmm. as the U.S. has in the past. But such action for action agreements have not really progressed beyond the initial phase. And I don't see many reasons to be exuberant, to be optimistic that this time around we may have further progress just by the virtue of the leaders of North Korea and the U.S. sitting down together. Well, we'll see how things evolve from here. Things are changing very fast as we speak. Thank you so much, Sun Young Lee and Ian Hai Lin. Really appreciate gentlemen for being with us. You're watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Still to come on our program. This year's St. Petersburg International Economic Forum seeks some answers to top questions on building an economy of trust at a time of protectionism and big income inequality. That's up for discussion by now. Welcome back. You're still watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei, coming to you Monday to Friday on CGTN. This year's St. Petersburg International Economic Forum will be held this Thursday to Saturday. Building economy of trust will be the main topic. From inequality to reviving protectionism, the forum will be served as a dialogue on solving the differences and at the same time looking for responses to common opportunities and challenges brought by new technologies. Worthwhile ideas and initiatives in the works. The 22nd St. Petersburg International Economic Forum is just around the corner. Media reports say the forum expects about 15,000 participants this year. The forum was first held in 1997 and became an annual business event from the following year. Since 2005, it has been under the auspices of the Russian president, who has also attended each event. Participants include representatives from business communities, heads of international organizations, public officials, experts, scientists, and journalists. Since first being established 21 years ago, the forum has gradually developed into a platform for the discussion of key issues in the world economy, regional integration, and the development of new industrial and technological sectors as well as of the global challenges facing Russia and other nations. But in recent years, economic sanctions on Russia by Western countries have been dominating the forum discussions. In fact, the Russian government has carried out strong measures to stabilize the country's finances. Backwardness is our main threat and enemy. President Vladimir Putin said in this year's State of the Nation speech, and he also set a view of ambitious economic goals, including cutting Russia's poverty rate by half over the next six years. Meanwhile, Russia is the host country of the 2018 FIFA World Cup next month. 
Russia's central bank has unveiled a special 100-ruble banknote ahead of football's most lucrative event. At present, not only Russia but the whole world is facing unprecedented economic risks and challenges. This year's St. Petersburg International Economic Forum is expected to find ways of building an economy of trust against the backdrop of rising protectionism. For more discussion, we are joined in Beijing by Professor Liu Baochengdin of the Center for International Business Ethics with the University of International Business and Economics. Also joining us in Moscow, Russia, Mark Sloboda, International Relations and Security Analyst. Thank you, sir. And in New York, U.S., we invited Max Wolf, Professor of Economics from New School University. Welcome as well. Let me begin with you, Mr. Sloboda. St. Petersburg. International Economic Forum, that's one of the platforms Russia has hoped to create as one of the top-notch economic forum. Has it reached that stage? No, it, it, it hasn't. Um, uh, Russia has optimistic hopes for this format and uh, it keeps pushing it forward uh, in the hope of attracting investment. But uh, the last few years, the uh, illegal economic sanctions war that the West has waged unilaterally against Russia, uh, coupled with the oil price war with Saudi Arabia that uh, dealt a, a much more significant blow to Russia's economy, um, uh, have led to a, an atmosphere of uh, kind of stagnation uh, with regards to the Russian economy. Mm. Investors uh, I with increasing rounds of Western sanctions uh, have shied away from investing in the Russian economy. But in the last year, despite the continuation of these measures, things are looking up um, uh, in terms of Russian GDP, the macro economy, right. and I think we see, may see a little bit more growth out of this year's settlement, but certainly not uh, one of the top tier economic forums in the world now. Mm, not yet. Uh, Professor Wolf, we've seen the struggle of uh, the U.S. side in a way, thinking about whether to attend or not to attend, what format to attend. For example, Ambassador John Huntsman, who is the U.S. Ambassador to the United States, promised to speak and then he withdrew from the panels he was designed to participate because of another oligarch uh, who was actually on the list of the U.S. sanctions that was likely to be on the same panel with him. How is that example and case study, in a way, reflect about the complex relationship and the feeling that Russia and the United States feel toward one another? Yes, so unfortunately, there's a lot for the world to gain and for both the United States and Russia to gain for closer good relations between the United States and Russia. Quite unfortunately, though, those have not been the case, and it, quite frankly, doesn't look particularly promising that we're heading into the better relationships that would be beneficial. I think there are a bunch of, of issues here. One is that the United States has withdrawn from a series of international commitments and treaties, and that has created a little bit of hostility, uh, or, or more than a little bit, in many, many zones for, for all kinds <laughs> of reasons, whether that be our new you know, sort of protectionist policies on trade, withdraw from various climate agreements, or withdraw from various other cooperative agreements, uh, NAFTA, TPP, etc. Right. So that's created a, an atmosphere of, of let's say, non-cooperation. Additionally, there's been a lot of political heat around the relationship of various members of the Trump campaign with various parties in Russia and some issues to do with the 2016 elections in Russia. So politically, uh, what was already difficult because of the global environment is more difficult bilaterally between Russia and, and, and the U.S. for political reasons. Right. There are fundamental differences, some argue, Mr. Sloboda, between Russia and the United States. And certainly the interests of the two countries are dragging the two apart from one another. Secondly is, as what Professor Wolf just said, Mr. Mueller's investigation is still going on beyond the one-year time. So while that is going on, how much do you think the Trump administration will be able to have in terms of maneuvering space in dealing with Russia? 
I think Trump has, has, has pretty much given up on the possibility of improving relations. Mm. He's far more concentrated on his own political survival in the U.S. And I, I think this, this kind of pettiness where not only uh, do we see Russian uh, businessmen sanctioned by the United States, but even the U.S. ambassador, supposedly his job is to meet with not only you know the government but the the economic elite with it, refusing to even sit down and, and share the same forum is, is is really i think far more demonstrative of the the type of partisan political climate in the united states i i don't think there's going to be any movement. I think everything is focused on the midterm elections right now. Right. Um, and, and, you know, as far as uh, U.S.-Russia relations goes with this, with this uh, uh, economic summit, I, I don't think we're going to see any movement whatsoever. U.S.-Russia relationship is only part of the story we're likely to see in the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. Professor Liu, another bigger story is since the Cold War, the end of it, people see trade and economic ties usually become the foundation of any relationship, particularly between and among countries. But now, it seems that things are changing. Once again, whether trade and economic ties will still be the basis, on top of which other relationships, be it geopolitical or social issues and things like that, can rely on, that's become a bigger question. St. Petersburg Economic Forum likely also be a platform to reflect that debate. Professor. Uh, well, people, uh, particularly in the socialist bloc, really suffered a great deal over the ideological stereotype uh, that was really looming for a long period of time. So if, therefore, there was quite a sort of rebellion after the Cold War that uh, while well, they go more for the material comfort and go for utility and variety of goods, so they need to fill their stomach and right. dress them more nicely. But right now, the situation is really converging because uh, they see that uh, in order to guarantee, you know, to predict that I'm going to have you know, nice food and good clothes and affordability, so there needs to be institutional changes. There uh, needs to be certainty right. in the governance, uh, in uh, geopolitics, and also in the big nation relationship. Right. Talking about big nation relationship, um, Professor Wolf, we still see the Japanese Prime Minister, Shinzo Abe, together with the French President, Mr. Macron, are going to visit Russia. And they are also going to meet with Russian President Mr. Putin on the sideline of the Economic Forum in St. Petersburg. So it seems that within the so-called the West, there are different views about how relationships should be approached with Russia. Your thought? This is so absolutely. Particularly the United States has taken a very nationalist and very narrow view of energy policy and has been trying to influence pipeline routes in ways that are disadvantageous for Russia and advantageous for American exporters down the road and that has to do with energy security both for folks in Germany, France, Japan, you know, so the nations that you immediately referenced in the comment as well as some beyond that and so that's become uh, another sort of wedge and I would say that the Trump administration has been pretty radically different in its disposition toward allies of all types, um, new, established or emerging mm. and what we've seen with the Iran sanctions decision, the trade policy the tenor of trade negotiations with China, the tenor of trade negotiations with Canada and Mexico is a sort of attempt by the United States to unilaterally rewrite and force new rules and that does one thing unfortunately historically very well which yeah. is it creates new constituencies opposed to your policy. And I think we're beginning to see that. I think that's part of what's going on with Mr. Macron as well as the Shinzo Abe decisions to have some of the, the meetings particularly on energy policy. Mm. Mr. Slobada, if you look at what Shinzo Abe is likely to discuss with Vladimir Putin, one could take a look at some of the list of things that the two sides agreed upon just a few years ago when the two heads of states were meeting. And now it seems that some of those are already been in the action stage. So despite whatever is going on between Washington and Moscow, it seems that other capitals are thinking differently. Or are they, Mr. Sloboda? Your judgment here. 
Yeah, I, I don't think we're going to see much dialogue between the U.S. and Russia. I think this entire summit is actually going to be overshadowed uh, by w what we can see as a Trump regime in the U.S. that is uh, effectively waging economic war on, on mus much of the world. Not only, it, of course, does it have uh, uh, ever-increasing rounds of sanctions against Russia, um, it's uh, engaged in an economic war of tariffs uh, now uh, that it started with China. Um, it uh, has sanctions, of course, on Syria and North Korea. And on top of pulling out of, unilaterally out of the Iran deal, um, it um, is leveling new sanctions against Iran and threatening to level sanctions against European companies that continue to do business with Iran. Now, this is coupled in the last few days with the Trump administration's thinly veiled economic threats mm. against Germany, uh, that unless it uh, cancels uh, a, a long-planned uh, Nord Stream 2 uh, energy pipeline uh, that will go underneath the Baltic Sea to Germany, that uh, it, it will engage in another round of uh, unilateral economic war on Europe. And I, I think that this is, is a type of, of arrogance and bombacity. Um, I, I think that you might actually see a little bit of movement of European leaders towards Russia, at least insofar as regards their own energy security. Uh, mm. I, I mean, Trump dictating energy security to Europe, uh, you know, m not to mention uh, uh, trade issues. I mean, Macron just wow. recently asked rhetorically uh, about the possibility of, e of uh, U.S. sanctioning uh, e EU companies. What are we, vassals of the U.S.? Well, uh, unfortunately to that, up till now at least, the, the answer to that has been we. Uh, the Europeans have been vassals to the okay. U.S., and, and maybe perhaps at this summit we'll see a little bit of independence uh, exerting their own at least economic sovereignty. When we are talking about the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum, one of the other things that comes to mind is what are some of the initiatives that have been proposed by countries participating, or countries that are willing despite of the deadlocks that we are seeing today, despite of the conflict between the United States and many of the economies in the world, what can be done? Uh, Mr. Liu, here I have to go to you about the Belt and Road Initiative, about the Eurasian Corridor, two concepts. One is the initiative originally coming by China, and the other, of course, originally coming from Russia. Uh, will these two initiatives become, in a way, part of the hope? about what can be done, Professor Liu. Well, it can be integrated as a part of the package because, uh, you know, initially we, we've been talking about the uh, uh, two roles. One is on the roll, uh, that's uh, typically the Silk, Silk Road Belt, and then the Maritime Sea Roads. And then, you know, uh, we have uh, really expanded together uh, by working with many of those partners uh, you know, the big land bridge, the uh, sort of Siberia, and now we are talking about the, uh, the fourth road, uh -huh. uh, which can really penetrate through the, uh, uh, the uh, Antarctic Ocean. So where Russia can play a very important role in terms of the uh, ice breaking and uh, uh, in safeguarding those uh, transportation. And uh, uh, now, uh, you know, it is, it is really a perfect synergy uh, if China can work uh, more with the Russia and, uh, and all the neighboring uh, countries uh, very substantially by converging on the same type of uh, uh, railway okay. tracks that can really provide a faster and safer transportation and logistic, ser uh, logistic service along the Belt and Road. See. So we need better coordination. Uh, but better coordination, really. Uh, Mr. Sloboda, I mean, on the one hand, there could be repetition and competition between these two initiatives, even though two sides have been saying, no, 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 we are having wonderful cooperation. Secondly is the issue of trust as well, particularly the issue of trust when it comes to business deals. Whether those business deals that have been promised a long time will actually be implemented, whether conditions are ripe in both systems and situations in both countries that will make those uh, deals done. Uh, Mr. Sloboda, we have seen some previous case studies that would suggest the other way around. I think 
the, the one belt, one road has largely subsumed that project, even, even saved it, you could say. And Chinese capital I, I, I has been essential. Russian Chinese trade have been growing dramatically. I haven't seen any signs of real competition mm -hmm. uh, in the area. There has long been the, the uh, that Russia would take the forefront politically, socially, culturally because of its long standing ties, and, and China would take the economic and infrastructure initiative, which it's specialized in. And I, I, I think I it's it. worked extremely well. I think it will continue to work that way. Um, and I think that, you know, Russia's increasing ties with China and decoupling from the West and looking to its to its east, both to China and to its partners in the former Soviet Union in the east, is, is the best path of development, and perhaps the only economic path of development mm -hmm. that Russia really has at the moment. Mm. Professor Liu, before we go, after the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum, the Russian president is likely to make a visit to China in Beijing. After that, he's also going to the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit. So it seems that there are a lot of interactions, uh, very intense, and in a way with a lot of contents also, as some suggest. Uh, Professor Liu, your thought? Well, uh, there has been a lot of fanfare and multilateral, uh, multi layers of communication channels, and we also seen, uh, have noticed substantial progress, but there is still a large potential that needs to be untapped. Uh, you know, uh, between China and uh, Russia in uh -huh. particular. Uh, you know, the, I think one very important issue that I, I really collected opinions from the business community is that uh, uh, we still rely on better rule of law, uh, uh, you know, between uh, these two countries. And so because uh, investors and traders, they need better predictability. And of course, you know, the, uh, particularly in terms of protection of intellectual property uh, mm. is also very important. So therefore, you know, after all the big guys talk, there should be, you know, the, uh, uh, the guys that can really walk the walk right. to produce the right type of action plan and also the milestones that can be achieved. There we go. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Liu Baocheng, Mr. Mark Slabada, Professor Max Wolf. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us. That is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World Inside CGTN into your search engine. Or check out our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Tina Weibo from Tianwei and everyone on the World Inside team. Thanks for watching. Tune in again next time for insights from China and around the world. Good night.